Today with us is Dr. Louis Darknell. His newest book is, could I have a copy of the book, please? The Knowledge, How to Rebuild Our World from Scratch. So, it's sort of, a, you know, like when I was pitched uh, by the publishers, you know, like, hey, you should, you should have Louis, you know, like come and give a talk at Google. I was looking at that. Okay, what is this, the knowledge? I mean, you know, like, there's a lot of knowledge and all that stuff. And then I, I read, you know, like a description which says, uh, here, I'll read it for you. So maybe it was an asteroid impact, a nuclear war, or a viral pandemic. Whatever the cause, the world as we know it has ended, and you and the other survivors must start again. What key knowledge would you need to not only survive in the immediate aftermath, but uh, avert another dark ages and accelerate the rebooting of civilization from scratch? Which I thought was an excellent idea for a technology book, you know, like how to make the history of technology, you know, like more fun. Well, not fun really, but you know, like it's sort of, you know, like present the history of technology in a different way. And I think a lot of people actually agree that you know, like the book is a great read. So you know, like just to quote from the Times, the knowledge uh, is a New York Times and Sunday Times bestseller and was also awarded the Times New Thinking Book of the Year. Or from the Wall Street Journal, the knowledge is a fascinating look at the basic principles of the most important technologies undergoing modern, undergarding uh, modern society. It's a fun read full of optimism about human ingenuity, which is something that I liked. A terrifically engrossing history of science and technology, The Guardian. The ultimate do-it-yourself guide to rebooting human civilization, nature. So Dr. Louis Dirtnell is a UK Space Agency Research Fellow at the University of Leicester. So this is you know, like a rocket scientist here. Uh, he also holds uh, an STFC, Science in Society Fellowship, and alongside his astrobiology research, writes regular science articles in newspapers and magazines. He has appeared in TV shows such as the BBC Horizon, Wonders of the Universe, and documentaries on National Geographic, Discovery, and History Channels. Please uh, join me in welcoming Louis Dirtnell to Google. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you all very much for coming along uh, to hear me. Uh, my name is Lewis, as, as you've just heard, and I'm a research fellow based at the University of Leicester uh, in the Space Research Centre there. And my day job, uh, what I do when I'm not running off writing books, is working within astrobiology, which is a relatively new field of science, all about extending what we know about the origins and the survival limits of life here on Earth, and extending that to the possibility of life and other planets, in particular our next-door neighbour planet, Mars, where I spend most of my time thinking. What can, could, could terrestrial life tolerate and survive the conditions on the surface of Mars? Or more importantly, what tests could we design to put on a Mars rover and send to the red planet to try to detect those signs of life, those so-called biosignatures? But something I've been thinking about a lot more over the last uh, two or three years is on something completely and utterly different. And let's imagine that this has actually happened. There's been some kind of global catastrophe, a doomsday event. And the vast majority of humanity has died and our civilization has collapsed. But let's say that some people have survived. Let's say that the, the room we're in here in Google has served as some kind of hardened bunker. And we have survived the end of the world as we know it and we stumble outside in an hour's time and find ourselves in the ruins of the civilization that came before us. Well, what now? What would you need to know? Not just to survive in the immediate aftermath, but to thrive in the long term. How could you go about rebuilding a society for yourself, a society from scratch? And what could you do to actually accelerate the rebooting of civilization, to, to recover all of the science and technology that we have today? Could you navigate some kind of shortcut route through that vast interlinked network of scientific discoveries and new technologies that they allow, and then new scientific discoveries you can make from applying new technology, like the telescope or the microscope, to find out new things? Could you navigate a shortcut route through that network rather than kind of meandering 
uh, stumbling down Blind Alley's route that we took the first time around. So could you accelerate what took us perhaps 10,000 years the first time and squash that down into perhaps a few generations or a few centuries if you're trying to recover from scratch with hindsight, knowing what we know now? So in short, if we were to be a community of survivors, what would be the one book that you would want handed to you as a manual for rebuilding the world from scratch, to reboot civilization? And it should come as no surprise, and that is the book uh, that I've tried to write uh, called The Knowledge. But I think I should, I should obviously come clean with you um, right at the beginning. I do not think the world is actually about to end. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not coming from the point of view of a survivalist or a prepper. I'm not talking about survival skills or how you can skin badges. I've come from a scientific background and I've been very interested to explore as a thought experiment all of the behind the scenes basics. What are the foundations that support our modern world? All the things that we just take for granted in our everyday lives. How does all of that work? And importantly, how did it develop through history? What enables civilizations to progress? And therefore, how could you try and accelerate that process the second time around? Now, I think a very neat example of the challenges that we would face trying to start everything from scratch are uh, presented in, a, in an essay by Leonard Reed called I Pencil. Um, now, the I Pencil isn't some great new gadget coming out from Apple. It, it's a story, it's a narrative told from the point of view of a pencil, from this simplest tool or implement that we're ever likely to interact with or use in our day-to-day -day lives, it turns out there is not a single person on the planet that knows how to make a pencil. No one person on the planet. Because, of course, human knowledge is distributed across the entire population, from people that know how to operate a timber mill, or mining ore, metal ore, out of the ground, or refining the fuels that we use to transport and move everything around. There's no one person that knows all the details of all of those parts. And this is just the simplest part of our everyday lives. So imagine kind of multiplying that amongst all the higher technology that we rely upon today. And the, the kind of thought experiment that I'm talking about here, about how to go right back from scratch and preserve the most valuable knowledge that you could, has been touched upon um, through the years. There's nothing truly original or novel about what I'm talking about here. Um, I'm sure many of you will, will know of things like the Global Village Construction Set uh, or the Toaster Project, which was run by a guy called Thomas Thwaites, who also lived in London. Uh, so I interviewed him when I was researching for the knowledge. And he tried to make a toaster from scratch. And I don't just mean buying components and, and screw driving them together. I mean going underground into an iron mine and coming out with some rust-coloured rocks and trying to smelt them in his back garden uh, in a dustbin. Um, and, and what he produced was this grotesquely beautiful toaster at the end, uh, which never worked. The first time he plugged it into the mains, it almost caught fire. A great big puff of magic smoke came out the top, and it never worked. But, but that's kind of the point of the project, to demonstrate just how hard even the simple things we take for granted would be if you had to make or do them for yourself from scratch. And perhaps the earliest example dates all the way back to the 1750s, when the very earliest encyclopedia writers, people like Dennis Diderot, were trying to make a genuine effort to write down the sum total of human knowledge that was known at that time. They tried to write the total book, the book that contained everything. And Diderot, in fact, explicitly considered uh, his duty in compiling and writing this encyclopedia was to was to serve as a store of knowledge. If civilization were to collapse, you would want to store the most vital knowledge and protect it as a seed, as a kernel, so you could then uh, rebuild again afterwards. Back in the 1750s, people were much more aware of how even great civilizations can collapse, like Rome and Greece and Egypt, and perhaps we're a little bit more arrogant today at how vulnerable civilizations uh, can be. And so the major themes that I researched and, and wrote about. These are blatantly the, the chapters of the book. Um, talking about things from agriculture and how so few of us today have any real idea about how to walk out into a muddy field with a handful of seed and make food come back out of that field before the winter draws in and you starve to death. Or talking about different materials and substances. If you just reach into your pocket now and pull out all the things you might find in there from coins to, to gadgets or different devices, even like basic stuff, like how do you get metal to come out of rock, out of the ore? 
How many people really know how to do that anymore? And yet think how vital materials like metals really are. Um, and I'll, during the talk, I'll skip through some of these other areas of, of medicine and power and communication. But actually, the chapter that I found most satisfying, as, again, as a mini thought experiment to research and write about, was this penultimate chapter, Time and Place. And again, the thought experiment for this might be, imagine you wake up from a coma, or you stumble out of a cryogenic pod, or you've fallen through a time warp, and you find yourself somewhere on the Earth at some point in the future. But you have no idea where you are or when you are. So what simple observations can you make? How can you work from first principles to calculate where on the planet you are, what the dress you are, what latitude and longitude you're at, but also when you are, not just the time of day, not if it's lunchtime, you can build a sundial relatively easily, but what is the date? What day of the year is it? How could you reconstruct the calendar from scratch? Or even work out what year it might be 10,000 years in the future from observing things around you. And again, these aren't frivolous exercises. Being able to work out where you are on the planet is the, is the absolute essence, is the prerequisite for navigation and exploring the oceans and trading. And being able to track your progress through the seasons and using the calendar is an absolute prerequisite for agriculture and making sure you put your seeds in the ground at the right time and take them out at the right time of harvest so you don't starve to death. Um, Boris, when do we run until? Sorry. How long is the talk? How long is the slot? We don't really mean as long as we want, do we? Um, and then I've got about 45 minutes. I suddenly thought I probably should have checked that before I launched myself in. But if we, um, if we stay within the kind of premise for the thought experiment, this post-apocalyptic world where most of the people have suddenly died, but the stuff is left lying around, you'd be afforded a grace period. You wouldn't have to work out the very first morning when you wake up with a hangover from the night before when the world as we know it has ended. You wouldn't have to work out agriculture for yourself immediately because you could scavenge and forage for what you need. And particularly within food, today we are exceedingly good at preserving and stockpiling food. We create artificial winter. We, use, we exploit the gas laws to make refrigerators and freezers to preserve food. And particularly with the canning process, this food would remain good for decades. So again, as a thought experiment, I wanted to know if I was locked in an average supermarket, how long could I survive for before I'd either eaten all of the food or had gone off before I could get around to eating it? And conveniently, the average supermarket was the one just down the road from where I live in North London. And I walked up and down all of the aisles, multiplying up all of the food that was there, dividing it by the amount you would need to eat per day to survive. And it turns out that a single supermarket could keep you alive for 55 years, or 63 years, if you're happy to eat all the canned dog food and cat food <laughs> as well. There is a vast reserve of food lying around that you could keep yourself going, you could coast upon, dine out on the leftovers, whilst you work out through trial and error how to do farming for yourself before that food rounds out and it becomes a matter of life and death. And obviously beyond food, drinking water is another absolute re requirement for, for healthy life. So how can you apply modern knowledge, mon modern understanding, to know for a fact that the water you're about to put to your lips and drink is not going to kill you, that it doesn't contain cholera or typhoid or any other number of waterborne diseases which have been the, the scourge of humanity throughout history? And again, if you're scavenging through the abandoned supermarkets and, and dead cities, you can get things like kitchen bleach. And if you dilute kitchen bleach enough, do not drink it neat. <laughs> if you dilute kitchen ble bleach enough, you can chemically disinfect the water and it will be safe to drink. You're exploiting the chemistry of chlorine in exactly the same way the water coming out of the faucets is treated with chlorine to disinfect it and make it safe to drink. If you can't find any kitchen bleach, you can use swimming pool chlorine. So sodium hypochlorite or calcium hypochlorite will disinfect water for you. But actually there's an even simpler way. A process called SODIS or solar disinfection, which has been touted by the World Health Organization around the developing world to, to break the disease cycle and stop hundreds of thousands of people dying of diarrhoea. And all you need to do is fill an empty plastic bottle with water and leave it in the sun. And because that bottle is essentially constraining the water to be very shallow, the ultraviolet rays in the sunlight can shine straight through and kill any pathogens that are in there. You can come back a day or two later, drink that water, and know for a fact that it's safe to drink. Now, fire as well 
it has been an absolute foundation of society for millennia, for thousands and thousands of years. But again, I suspect there's not many people in the room here. If you couldn't reach for a box of matches or for a lighter, could you actually get a fire started for yourself? How many people know how to rub sticks together to, to ignite a fire successfully? And we don't just use fire for cooking food and killing germs and keeping us warm. Civilization uses fire to take the base stuff that we dig out of the ground and transform it into the most useful substances and materials of history. We use fire to take river mud, clay, and turn it into bricks we use for building. We use fire to get metal out of rock, out of the ore. And we use fire to drive a lot of the crucial chemistry that our society depends upon, like making artificial fertilizers that feed over two billion people on the planet today. Our modern world is as reliant on fire as a Stone Age family huddled around the campfire we just hidden it behind the scenes in our factories and power stations, but it's still as critical. So how do you get a fire going? Um, I've got a quick video to show you, um, which we filmed for the uh, book coming out in Harback last year. Uh, and this is about how you can use uh, unusual combinations of everyday items to start a fire if you can't find matches or lighters. Uh, and this one is how you can use a smoke detector or a fire alarm to start a fire, <laughs> paradoxically. Um, so the way that you uh, start a fire with a fire alarm, with a smoke detector, is to pop off the back and take out the batteries that you find inside, and specifically the 9-volt batteries, which are special because they have the two terminals, the positive and negative terminal, uh, both at the same end. And, it's, and if you also scavenge from, from an abandoned supermarket or, or house uh, some steel wool, you can short circuit the battery through the steel ball. Do not do this at home, <laughs> but, but totally have a go of this at home. And if you brush ever so gently and then blow on it like you would any kind of kindling, you can get that metal to absolutely burst into flames. This isn't dry newspaper or kindling burning. That's the metal itself bursting into flames. And if you can crack the trick of, so, so obviously what we're exploiting here is the, is the principle of electrical resistance. You're passing a current through a very thin wire with very high resistance, so it gets hot and bursts into flames. If you can crack the trick of getting a thin wire very hot and not burst into flames, you've just invented the light bulb. This is exactly what Edison solved uh, to exploit exactly the same principle. And so electricity as well is, has been a foundation of our modern society. And what I tried to do throughout the book, throughout the knowledge, was to keep basing the things I'm talking about on real-world examples. Not kind of arm-waving speculation, but occasions in history where people have, have solved challenges and problems in particular ways. And what we're looking at here is a city called Grazda, which during the mid-1990s and the Bosnian-Serbian War, the city was surrounded by the army and isolated, cut off from the rest of the world. And although NATO was able to get uh, food and, and medication dropped to them, they were cut off in the electrical grid. They were thrown back into the Middle Ages in, in the sense of, of this component of our modern world. And so what the inhabitants of Grazda were able to do was scavenge and forage from rubbish, junk, just lying around their city and doing like junkyard wars, but for real. They made these water wheels, which they dumped into the, into the river in the fast-flowing stream, tethered to the bridge here. And the crucial component, right in the middle of each of these water wheels, the thing that converts that rotation into electricity is an alternator, a component you can scavenge under the bonnet, under the hood of any car or abandoned truck you find lying around, and just jury-rig stuff together to, to keep your civilized lifestyle going. I think it's an incredible example of the ingenuity and resourcefulness of just everyday people under challenging circumstances. This is the kind of skills you'd want to try and apply to rebuilding society again from scratch yourself after an apocalypse. But sooner or later, this grace period will draw to an end. Things will run out or decay or deteriorate or you'll just have used them up without making them yourself. And particularly with agriculture, the most important plants in history have been these, the, the cereal crops. And in particular, the first three, wheat, rice and maize, which have supported all of the civilizations of Europe, Asia and the Americas. And the dependence of, of, of humanity throughout civilization, our dependence on these cereal crops means that throughout history, humanity has survived by eating grass. Just like our, our cows and our sheep, the cereal crops evolved as fast-growing species 
of grass. They make an ideal plant to eat in that sense. But we had a problem. The kernel of wheat is a, is a fabulous nugget of nutrition, but it's hard and indigestible. So we need to break down that grain to release nutrients to be absorbed by our bodies. And the main inventions through history that have helped with this have been the Roman water wheel and the medieval windmill. These are obviously ways of harnessing natural power sources, hydropower and wind power. But the crucial component of both of these is this pair of cylindrical slabs, the millstones, which turn over each other and grind that grain into flour. This is a relic of Stone Age technology, right in the heart of the complex mechanisms of the windmill here. And we take that flour and we cook it. We bake bread. And the heat of the fire that we use for cooking makes the food taste nice, but more importantly, it helps to break down that nutrition so that we can absorb it into our bodies. So in a very real sense, the millstone is like a technological extension of our own molar teeth. And the oven we use for baking bread or the pot we use for boiling rice is like an external pre-digestive system. Humanity doesn't have the benefit of four stomachs like a cow. We're biologically disadvantaged in that sense. So we've had to adopt technology to enable us to live our fast-growing species of grass. Now, again, I suspect not many people would know where to go to pick up some seed corn or some wheat that you can put in the ground and grow and harvest. And so this is where you would go. This is the uh, Svalbard Global Seed Vault. Uh, this is the front door. These are blast-proof doors. And so this place could genuinely survive uh, a nuclear exchange. Uh, and the fact that it's built into the side of a mountain way up in the Arctic Circle means the permafrost of the mountain around it, that even if the grid goes down, this thing would remain naturally refrigerated for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. You would hope that when you got here, someone had left the door key under the mat at the front uh, so you could get open those doors. But this is designed to be like a biological save file, a genetic library of all of the major crops we grow today. And this is exactly where you'd want to go to get wheat or, or rice or any other cereal crops or other crops you would need to reboot agriculture for yourself. If you don't know where Svalbard is, I very helpfully for you provided the latitude and longitude <laughs> coordinates you would go to. And if you don't know your latitude and longitude coordinates, if you don't know what your address is right here and therefore what direction to start heading in, Turn to that time and place chapter in the book and I explain to you from first principles, using stuff around you, how you can determine exactly where you are and therefore how to navigate to there. So as far as possible, everything within the knowledge, everything within the book interlinks to everything else. I, I don't assume any prior or external knowledge. I contain as far as I can everything you'll need in this one manual. Um, I'll, I'll skip through substances quite quickly. But in, in terms of kind of software design and technology, you'll be familiar with similar diagrams like this, the kind of chains of dependencies of to make this, you need that, which needs this, which needs that, and how they link together um, to, to build capability over time. And these are all the, the main things that you need to, to run a society and that we've relied upon and depended upon through history. And the nodes, the kind of hub of, of the uh, chemical capability, the substances tree, are things like lime, and soda, which you may not have even ever heard of, but they are the most fundamentally important things that you rely upon day upon day in everyday lives without realizing. Uh, and I explain how to make lime for yourself or soda for yourself and how you use soda to make everything from paper to soap to glass, how you start with glass and then you can now grind lenses to make, uh, to make lenses to make telescopes and microscopes and use microscopes to discover germs to stop you getting sick. Um, so all of this links them together. There are ingredients and recipes in the book as to how to do all that basic chemistry for yourself. And within transport, what you would really hope the post-apocalyptic society, that you could stop the regression before you reach a state like this, <laughs> where you can no longer run mechanization. You've lost engines and machinery. And it's not, this is more important than just jumping in your, in your car and nipping down the road. We use machinery, the internal combustion engine, for doing everything in the world around us and releasing the effort of our own muscles. So the question is, how can you run machinery without access to crude oil and the diesel and gasoline that are refined from it? Um, I've got another video that I'm going to load up briefly. So uh, this is the point on the TED stage last week where I almost set fire to my own head. Um, so I'm not going to do that indoors again. I'm going to show you the video. Um, so what we've got... 
uh, is a gasifier stove, it's called. And I made this one myself out of just some old junk tin cans. And there's a big outer can and a smaller can inside it and, and holes at the bottom of both. So when you put some newspaper and just a small handful of twigs in the inner can and light it, it draws air up through the, the bottom of that fire to keep it nice and intense, just like any barbecue. But what is unique about this gasifier stove is that there is a second row of holes right at the top. So as the wood breaks down in the heat of that fire, undergoes pyrolysis, it releases lots of gases and vapors and smoke, which is itself combustible. And you then reintroduce oxygen into that hot gas mix and combust everything at that point. So when this is up and running, it is smokeless and exceedingly efficient. And just to show you how, how effective one of these really primitive, simple gasifier stoves can be, um, this is me in a garage in London uh, demonstrating. And if you just watch, I, I've, I've genuinely put only a tiny handful of little bits of twig in there. There's very little fuel that I'm loading this up with. Uh, and in a second, I'm going to light this gas fire stove uh, using a lighter, but I hope that I've convinced you at this point that I could have used a smoke detector if I really wanted to, <laughs> to get the gasifier stove up and, up and running. And it, it smokes a little bit as it first gets going. But if you watch, as I put the, the flue on top, which again is just made from some old tin cans, within about four seconds, the smoke disappears and is replaced by this four-foot jet of flame coming out the top. So this is, this is the air, the, the airflow coming up through that fire and the second row of air holes combusting all of those producer gases, the gases that are given off by the wood as it breaks down that would otherwise have just flown away um, and blown the wind. Uh, these kind of things are also called rocket stoves for, for perhaps obvious reasons. So take off the flue. You, you can see how effective this is at, un, at releasing all of the energy that's been locked up in the wood. And we've zoomed in now to the top. And you can see these jets of flame coming in from that upper row of air holes, where those producer gases are combusted when you mix oxygen with them again. And this is exactly the kind of technology, uh, the appropriate technology or intermediate technology, that is being touted around the developing world uh, by development agencies. Because you can make this kind of stuff yourself. It doesn't require any high tech. The fact that it's smokeless means it's much, much healthier for cooking with in closed, cramped conditions. And the fact that it's very efficient means it makes the most effective use of the firewood that a family can collect. But what you can do is scale up a gasifier stove from something the size of a soup can, like this, to something the size of a trash can, strap it to the back of a car, and you can run a car using wood as fuel rather than oil or gasoline or diesel. This is the gasifier on the back. This is where the wood is breaking down on the heat, releasing those producer gases, which are piped over the roof of the car down into the engine where they're finally allowed to mix with oxygen and explode usefully to drive this car. Now, I'll admit to you, this does look like some kind of crazy steampunk, post-apocalyptic Mad Max contraption, but it works. And this isn't just some kind of, kind of fringe hobby. During the Second World War, during the Second World War and all the oil shortages uh, back then, there were over a million gasifier-powered cars, wood-powered cars, across Europe. This is exactly the kind of intermediate technology you could stop the re further regression of your society and start pulling yourself back up by your own bootstraps. Uh, if we turn to materials, I've, I've, I've already shown you the kind of substances tree and how you extract things like metal from the rock, from ore, and how we've done that through history. But that's only really half of the problem. You've also got to, to make something useful out of that metal. You've got to transform a lump of metal into a tool. And what I was also very, very keen to do when I was researching for the two, three years of, of this, the, the knowledge project, uh, I didn't want to just sit down in kind of libraries and learn from books or by interviewing people. I wanted to get some first-hand, hands-on experience doing stuff for myself so I could then write about it with experience. So I spent a day in a traditional 16th century blacksmith, an iron forge. And when you think about it, the, the, the kind of craft of the blacksmith is, is really simple. You take a big pile of fuel, either charcoal or coke, set fire to it and force air through it with a set of bellows so it gets really, really hot. You take your lump of metal you want to start working on, shove it on the hot place till it gets very hot and then soft, 
and then hit it with another lump of metal which is still cold and therefore still very hard. You use iron to work on iron. So I, I felt very smug with myself. After spending a day battering the hell out of uh, this bit of metal, this lump of iron on a hammer and anvil, I made for myself uh, a tool, made a knife, which you can come up and have a look at afterwards if you'd like. Um, and the very first thing I did when I got back home was march straight into the kitchen and use the knife that I'd made with my own hands to cut a loaf, cut some cheese, and make myself a post-apocalyptic grilled cheese from scratch. I was absurdly smug with myself. But if you look more closely, either on the picture here or by coming up and having a look at the actual artifact, I notice that there's a ruinous crack where the, the handle meets the blade. And I've never had the, the guts to go back and try my knife again. So I've actually done quite a bad job of making this tool, making this knife from scratch. But the important thing is, I know what went wrong. I know how to go back and have another, another try, another go, and improve. And so as a microcosm, this knife kind of represents how we have advanced and progressed through history, through this reiterative cycle of trial and error, and applying your rationality and critical thinking to work out why something has failed, and therefore improve upon it next time to, to, to bug hunt and fix those issues. Within communication, um, the, the kind of gateway technology, the thing you'd want to leapfrog immediately back to, uh, would be something like the printing press. Because before the printing press, if you wanted to copy a document, if you wanted to share your ideas, the only way of doing that would be having a room full of people copying things out by hand. This is enormously time-consuming and laborious and expensive. And that means that only rich people get to choose what ideas are allowed to spread. But with the invention of the printing press, Knowledge itself, human understanding becomes democratized. Anyone can share any ideas they want with everyone else. And it accelerates not just kind of technology and scientific discussion, but political ideologies and philosophies. It, it accelerates many areas of your, of your society at the same time. And this is exactly, again, the kind of technology you want to leapfrog as quickly as possible to help rebooting your civilization. Now, another thing I was very, very smug about when I realized I could pull this off was that within the pages of the knowledge, I explain how to make your own paper from scratch. I explain how to make your own ink, and I explain how to construct a rudimentary printing press. So it's almost as if, within the pages of the knowledge, it contains the genetic instructions for its own reproduction. Tongue in cheek, of course, only one copy of this manual would need to survive the apocalypse, and it tells people how to reproduce it and then hand out copies to everyone that survived and might need to know. And just as a proof of principle, here is a, a few pages of the book, the page about how to build a printing press, printed on a rudimentary printing press on handmade paper. This is <laughs> the, the proof of, of concept there. That's going to fall over. Um, the very final thing uh, that I was going to mention was in advanced chemistry. And I showed you the, the kind of capabilities tree of, of simple chemistry and making things like soda and lime uh, or nitrates. But sooner or later, as our civilization encountered during our history, you reach a threshold. You cannot extract the things you need out of a natural environment quickly enough to support your population. So you have to, at that point, invent ways of making artificial substances, making artificial soda like we worked out in the early 1800s, or making artificial nitrates that like we worked out in the early 1900s to make artificial fertilizer and explosives and, and gunpowder. And that, that single chemical reaction of the harbor process makes this foul-smelling compound ammonia, which is responsible for feeding a third of the world's population today. It's that single chemical step, which I talk about in the advanced chemistry uh, chapter. But I also talk about the, the curious chemistry, the light responsive chemistry of silver. And what I'm about to show you is the most narcissistic slide I've got in the entire stack. Because I wanted even the author's mugshot on the back of the book to remain true to the premise of the knowledge. I wanted to make a photo from scratch by myself. So I went down to Laycock Abbey uh, in England where photography was, was invented. The very first photographic negative was created in the 1830s and 1840s. And I worked with, uh, with a historian there to mix together the very simple chemistry uh, douse that onto a plate of glass, load that into a primitive single lens camera, and took this picture, took this portrait. And believe me, this took all day to get. 
Uh, now, this isn't a snapshot. That's a 16-second exposure. And I would challenge any one of you to sit absolutely dead still, not allow your head to twitch or move in the slightest or your facial muscles to relax at all for 16 seconds to get a picture. Because if you don't, if, if you move in the slightest, your entire head blurs into this ghostly apparition. So that's why you can't smile naturally in these simple photographs. And you have to hold this almost sneery, to be fair, but kind of neutral, passive pose. And what you can't see is that behind me, there is a wrought iron stand with a skull clamp locked <laughs> to the back of my head to hold it absolutely still. So I'd put it to you that the reason all of our earliest photographs of Edwardian gentlemen and Victorian ladies, the reason they look so joyless isn't because they didn't know how to have a good time back then. It's because they've had to be sat and cannot smile and someone's jammed a skull clamp into the back <laughs> of the head. Like, our, our, the, the way that we view history, the way that we can see back into time, is distorted by the technology that was available at that moment to, to capture that moment and allow us to see it. It's, it's a distortion of the technology that we had. Uh, if any of this has been of any interest to you, there's a, there's a book that you can get for $5, but an enormous amount of material is up on the book's website, on the dash knowledge.org. Um, there's lists of uh, the best books you can read, the best post-apocalyptic sci-fi, uh, books like The Earth Abides, or like Robinson Crusoe, or The Martian, which talk about starting from scratch and recovering through, through, uh, through the stages of capability. Um, there's all the videos that I've shown you short clips of. You can watch the, the whole four-minute video of how to start fires with different combinations of things you can scavenge around the house, including how you can start a fire with a bottle of water, which also is quite paradoxical. And there's also this article, all about Miley Cyrus. And this is another thought experiment. Imagine you had a, a time machine. You had a DeLorean. And you're going to go back 400 years into the past. What single scientific instrument would you take with you that could demonstrate or prove beyond doubt something fundamental, some profound truth about the world or the cosmos that people did, did not believe back then. And what I would bundle into the boot of my DeLorean before I'm going back to the 1500s would be Miley Cyrus, <laughs> or at least Miley and her wrecking ball. And I'd find a nice tall cathedral, set up Miley, uh, nice and comfortable, like she seems to be in the picture here. She's, she's having a whale of a time. Give her a jolly good shove and let her swing back and forth on this pendulum. And if you watched Miley during the course of the day, you'd notice that she swung back and forth, that pendulum seemed to twist over the ground. Now, there's no wind blowing, there's no force causing that pendulum to move. So the only conclusion you can come to is it is the entire Earth itself turning under Miley as she swings. You can, you can use nothing more than Miley to prove that the Earth is a big ball of rock and it turns on its own axis. The reason the sun seems to arch across the sky isn't because there's some fiery god in a chariot dragging it around. It's because we're stood on a, on a sphere. And even better than that, if Miley happens to have a wristwatch on as you kidnap her and bundle her into the boot of Dolores to take her back to the 1500s, <laughs> you can use nothing more than a wristwatch to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is the Earth that orbits the sun and not vice versa. You can demonstrate the heliocentric universe using Miley Cyrus. Imagine all of the trouble and strife that you could save Copernicus and Galileo and all the threats of being burned at the stake if only they'd had Miley back in the 1500s. Um, so thanks so much, guys, for, for listening so attentively and warmly. Um, we do still have maybe 10 minutes of time for questions. Thank you. Time for questions. We'll use the microphone, please. Um, first, I want to say that this book is one of the best books I've read in years. I absolutely loved it. You are a very kind person. Thank you for saying that um, over the microphone. Right. Um, <laughs> so so uh, I guess maybe I have two questions. Um, the first one is I, one of the things that I loved about it is, like, I, as you said, it ties everything together. And I found it just an absolutely fascinating way to look at education in a way that would make things more relevant. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about, like, how maybe you could apply this in this book in schools or things like that to maybe get people interested in things they wouldn't otherwise be interested in, like chemistry for me. Like it was a fabulous introduction to chemistry. And then the second thing I was wondering is, do you feel like there's stuff you had to leave out or you forgot? And like, what would you include if you had another book to, or more space to <laughs> the knowledge or things like that? Yeah. I suppose a follow-on book would kind of break the premise of the first one. 
you need this, but also this one now. <laughs> um, but your, your first point about education is a really good point, and it's something I'm very keen to try and get off the ground. Uh, this is my very last day of a month-long tour of Canada and the US, um, book, touring the book. And I started off um, in Toronto, in the University of, of Waterloo in, in Kitchener. And we're working there to try and build a syllabus um, for undergraduates or, or graduate studies basic on this, on what are the fundamentals of civilization, and how would you recover that capability? How do things link together? But I think you're right, I think it would be just as applicable and interesting and appropriate to much younger children, get into kind of secondary schools, if not even primary schools, just to open people's eyes to, to, the, to the world around us and how things work and how it all links together um, and, and what we take for granted. Um, so if anyone here at Google has got any contacts or any ways you might be able to help with that, please do ping me an email um, or come up and say hello afterwards. Um, as for your second point about what I missed out, um, I'm a scientist writing a, a popular science book that will go on that shelf in the bookshop. So I've, I've, I focus on science and technology. And clearly, there is more to building a stable society or a technologically advanced civilization than just knowing stuff. You need to have uh, good leadership. And, and there's a lot of sociological factors. And a strong economy is, is as necessary for building steam engines and factories as, as coal and, and the knowledge of the gas laws. Um, so all of that is, is, is kind of quietly left out because it's a hard thing to discuss the universals of in the way that you can discuss the universals of, of science or, or technology. Um, you may notice that the entirety of mathematics is slipped into a single footnote at the bottom of the page where I basically just cover my ass for not having talked about mathematics. Um, and that was, that was essentially an editorial decision. I had an entire chapter planned out and half written about the most crucial mathematics you need because clearly you need maths to build bridges and not have things fall down on you. Um, and there's good reasons why geometry and, and algebra would, were developed by ancient uh, Egypt and, and, and Islamic cultures. But at the end of the day, it's just you can't write about maths in the same way you can write about chemistry or technology or, um, or biology. And I didn't want to have basically a math textbook kind of shoved in there where I'm telling people about the basics of geometry and, and algebra. It wouldn't be fun to write. It wouldn't be fun to read. So I cheated and just didn't do any of it. All right, a uh, slightly different thought experiment. You and 999 other people are going on to a colony ship into deep sleep. You're going to land on what you know is a Goldilocks planet. It has a comparable composition to Earth. You get to bring whatever materials you want to provide a grace period, and you get a book. How different are those materials in that book from this one and the materials you mention? And what similarities do they have? Yeah, I mean, that, that is a great question. And I, I, I uh, explain very early in the introduction to the knowledge that although I've picked the thought experiment to be a post-apocalyptic world, this is equally applicable to falling through a time warp to 10,000 BC and wanting to make yourself the emperor and know everything you would need to know to accelerate history, um, or crash landing on a, on a, on a Goldilocks planet, on a, on a Gaia world. Um, and you, 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 you would go through pretty much exactly the same steps. And I've, I've tried to make the knowledge to, to not peg itself to any one particular kind of apocalypse or any particular state, but, but to be general um, in what it discusses. Um, and I had some very interesting conversations with two NASA researchers um, yesterday on exactly that question. If we are sending uh, ships to Mars to build a colony, what is the set, the, the mutually supporting set of tools you send with, with them so they, they become self-sustaining and self-supporting? And, and how, how might mining ore on Mars and trying to smelt the metals you need be different doing it on Mars? compared to Earth. What are the similarities, what are the differences? Um, so yeah, that, I'm, I'm running through that thought experiment as well as, as far as I can. Um, one thing I don't see in the uh, indexes uh, on the topic of uh, the bootstrapping of mechanical precision, you know, how to build a surface plate from scratch and things from that. Is, yeah. is that elsewhere in the book? I, I, I touch upon why it's important and, and why the Industrial Revolution wasn't just about knowing about burning coal and about making pistons, but being able to make pistons with the pre precision uh, enough so it doesn't kind of keep jamming and catching it. And I also talk about uh, the lathe and why the lathe is, is one of these. Uh, the lathe, like, like the knowledge which can reproduce itself, the lathe is a machine which can also reproduce. You can make all of the components for lathe using just one lathe. And in fact, even better than that, you can start making a lathe and use your half to finish lathe to make all the rest of the components you need. And there is an exquisite example of that pulling yourself up by your bootstraps uh, by a series of books uh, by Dave Gingery. And he started with nothing more than some sand, some clay, and some old Coke cans or, or other soda drink, uh, some aluminium. 
and he made a back garden furnace uh, with a bucket and the clay in it and uh, you know some kind of charcoal he chucked in to melt the cans and then start pouring them to sand to cast to start making components of a lathe. Uh, and once you've got a lathe, you can make a milling machine and many other machine tools. So he built an entire machine shop using some Alton cans and some pile of clay and a pile of sand. And if you wanted to, you can buy his series of books um, and, and do that process yourself. If you go to the, the book's website, um, I've listed the entire bibliography of that book and every single um, reference is hyperlinked. So you can go to either the free PDF or the website or download it off Amazon if you wanted to follow up. So I have another question. Uh, so we're storing more and more information electronically. At the moment we run out of electricity, nobody can recover it from a hard drive or SSD drive. And our next best uh, media is paper, which is very easy to destroy. And so how do we preserve this knowledge? Do we print it or? Like, we haven't invented anything better than printing paper. Yeah, so I, I talk about exactly that and the kind of digital black hole uh, in an article I wrote for the Guardian newspaper um, two, three weeks ago about what might be the, the optimum, the best storage medium. And although you can get an incredibly high density of information in, into kind of electronic storage, like a hard disk or USB um, dongle or whatever, you, if you pick up a USB dongle, it's basically closed to you unless you've got the computer which is running to, to read it off. Whereas something like a book is, is very kind of open access in that sense. You, all you need to be able to do is read and you can pick up the book and you have access to the instrument inside it. And actually acid-free paper is a pretty good storage medium. It, it does last pretty well. But I guess if you, if you really want to take this seriously, you would get some enormous granite slabs and kind of laser engrave them with, with everything you need to know, or at least enough information that you could bootstrap yourself to the next level to then read a much denser store of information and then maybe use that to bootstrap yourself to the next level. And what I'm basically describing here is Asimov's Foundation series, but uh, on a post-apocalyptic world. So I guess I have one question as well. So what if the survivors are actually in China and they don't speak uh, English? Oh, we're translating it. Okay. <laughs> For your flippant answer. Uh, hi, thanks for this. Um, so, of course, um, the post-apocalyptic post world is a big topic in fiction across all media. Uh, I'm curious if, A, you think there's any uh, examples out there where you think, wow, they do a really good job of this, um, and also, B, whether you think anyone, whether anyone, as far as you know, is using your book as a resource to try to do a good job of uh, figuring out this world. Um, I don't know about the second question. I mean, a, a bunch of people have... I get a bunch of emails a day from people that have read the book and found it very interesting and saying how they were trying out some of the experiments and, and things in their back garden or building a gasifier stove with their kids before a camping trip. Um, but I don't know if anyone's <laughs> trying to rebuild their own society on a desert island using the, using the book. Um, so I think most post-apocalyptic films do a bad job and it's mostly lone heroes running around in leather which is perhaps a little bit too tight and doing the kind of the Mad Max vibe. And, and clearly that's for, for dramatic tension. It, it's more exciting to look at people running around shooting each other for a film than a peaceable community trying to build a windmill out of recycled car parts. Um, and, and, and books are always much more nuanced in, in kind of approaching complex issues. And again, if you go, to, um, if you go under prepare of, of the, that tab on the website and under read, uh, there's a list of the best books which have approached these kind of ideas. So things like Robinson Crusoe or Swiss Fabian Robinson uh, deal with this. There's a more recent book by Andy Weir called The Martian, which is basically uh, Robinson Crusoe meets MacGyver marooned on Mars and has to work out how to not die and start kind of bootstrapping himself up before the rescue mission. Uh, that, that is an incredibly good book. I, I did very much enjoy uh, The Martian. Um, there's a much earlier book by Jules Verne called The Mysterious Island, um, which, which does a really good job of describing the actual information detail you would need in a way that Swiss Van Robinson kind of brushed over. And, and he goes through how to make you know, different materials and, and substances for yourself. Um, so have a read of that as well. Um, well one uh, quick question for you. Uh, if you did find yourself in this uh, post-apocalyptic world, and let's say you were back home in the UK or maybe you were in North America, while there's still some transportation that you could use, where would you go to settle down and start a, a new world? Yeah, I, I'm 
I'm not sure there's any particular place on the planet that would be ideally suited compared to anywhere else. I mean, obviously, don't start trying to rebuild civilization just outside Las Vegas in the middle of a desert. Don't start trying to rebuild society inside the Arctic Circle. You know, make things easy for yourself and go somewhere within the temperate zone of the planet where you've got reliable rainfall, fertile soil, a river nearby, for all of the same historical reasons that the early civilizations begun in exactly those environments. Um, but the one bit of advice I would give you is get out the cities as quickly as you can. Not least for, and I, I don't ever say the Z word in the entire book, but if, if a lot of people have died in the cities, they become quite unpleasant. They smell bad, but they also become a huge disease risk to you. But in the longer term, when you think about it, a, a city is an absurdly artificial bubble. And imagine trying to live in kind of a high-rise apartment block without electricity running the elevator anymore. You have to schlep up 20 floors of uh, flights of stairs to get to your apartment. And every time you want a drink of water, you have to lift up using your own muscles with a long rope, a bucket to get water to you. Um, and without kind of uh, water pressure in the pipes delivering that water or kind of gas pressure, to, you can't really live in a modern city um, without the, the life support system that civilization provides to that city. So get out of the city. Find yourself a nice rural spot with an old traditional house where there are fireplaces that you can burn bits of tree in to keep yourself warm and a nice plot of fertile soil that you can start rebuilding you know, the, the beginnings of, of farming in. Please uh, join me in thanking Lewis for it.